Evidently, I brought the weather from New York, and I apologize. <laughs> On behalf of the Daniel Pearl Foundation and Halal at Stanford, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the Daniel Pearl Memorial Lecture. I would like to thank the many co-sponsors for this evening's event that are too numerous to mention, but are noted in your programs. I would also like to personally thank our keynote speaker, Thomas Friedman. With his unique perspective and knowledge, I can think of no one who is more capable of making some sense of the turmoil in the Middle East. Recent events have had a profound effect on those of us who knew Danny. In the aftermath of his death in 2002, we could take some small degree of comfort and solace in the fact that every civilized nation, regardless of religion, expressed universal condemnation and revulsion for Danny's horrific murder. Fast forward to today, when the image of a reporter in an orange jumpsuit being led to his execution has now become a monthly event on social media. The ubiquity of these images cannot lull us into complacency, and we must recognize that they are the product of unadulterated evil that must be extinguished. Danny's humanity and courage were shared by the reporters murdered in Syria, including 20 Iraqi Muslim journalists, as well as the editorial staff of Charlie Hebdo. Like Danny, all of them used their writings in the service of truth and moral accountability. Without reporters, there are no narratives to protect the innocent and bear witness. When journalism dies and reporters are murdered in silence, what inevitably follows are the crematoriums of Germany the killing fields of Cambodia, and the empty villages of Rwanda. There is no greater atrocity than the intentional and premeditated targeting of an unarmed civilian population. On the eve of the question of Stanford divestment, I would point out that an ISIS firing squad and a Hamas rocket blindly aimed at an Israeli city are equally abhorrent and barbaric that the intentional murders of 10,000 Muslim civilians by ISIS last year are also deserving of our indignation and protest, and that there will be no answer for the Palestinian people while Israel and all its Arab neighbors are consumed with the existential threat posed by the Islamic State. For those of us who founded this memorial lecture, one concern we shared was the certainty that Danny would have hated the idea of being the center of all this attention. However, I do think it's safe to say that he would have wanted today's events to not only be about him, but also honor the memories of Kenji Gatto, Stephen Sotloff, James Foley, an unknown number of Iraqi journalists, and the staff of Charlie Hebdo. For Danny and these individuals, truth mattered. Inquiry, debate, and the pursuit of justice were their life's work. This great university rests on the very bedrock of these principles. In coming here tonight, we not only celebrate and remember the lives they lived, but reaffirm our investment in the very beliefs that allow humanity and civilization to go forward. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of introducing a very special woman she was Danny's classmate, my classmate, and my housemate, Karen Edwards. Hi, everyone. I'm here tonight to share with you just a bit about my friend, Danny Pearl, who inspired this uh, lecture series. And I'm going to share just a few personal notes. Um, Danny and I met as sophomores and shared many memorable times, from late nights at, co at our co-ed fraternity to attending each other's weddings many years later. As some of you have probably experienced as a Stanford student, it's pretty easy to maybe be in awe of some of your classmates, if not downright intimidated. Um, for me, Danny wasn't one of those classmates. Instead, he was very easy to get to know, low-key, kind of offbeat. It wasn't until years later that I was in awe of him. It was, it was fascinating a few years after we graduated to watch my college buddy start to make a difference on the, on the global stage. Danny was breaking barriers. 
He applied his offbeat humor and keen intellect to help people understand parts of the world that many Americans knew little about. He aimed to know his subjects intimately everywhere, regardless of their religion, education, status, or even their dangerous quirks. Strangers in strange lands became friends. He introduced these new friends to me and to Wall Street Journal audiences worldwide. From a career standpoint, Danny wasn't always a lauded international reporter. After we walked through our graduation ceremony together, Danny and I saw many of our classmates go off to jobs at blue chip companies and graduate schools, but Danny wasn't sure what he was going to do. He spent the summer as an intern at a paper in Indianapolis, and not long after, he was writing to me from his job at a convenience store in Sun Valley, Idaho. He was attracted, yet at the same time sort of repulsed, at the idea of becoming a ski bum. He said the convenience, job, the convenience store job was so boring that it numbed him into some of his very clearest thinking. I'd say that that was true because it was one of the most brilliant, inspiring letters I've ever read. That clear thinking shaped Danny's stories ideas, but it also shaped his ideals and his values, which were about peace, love, and understanding. And yes, he was an Elvis Costello fan. Unfortunately, these ideals and his insights made him a target of hatred. 2002, within months of the shock of 9-11, the world was stunned to hear that Danny, an innocent journalist, of all people, was kidnapped and murdered. Today, as Howard said, our news and social media are full of stories and images of brutal violence against journalists and others who work to promote understanding. So needless to say, their work is more important now than ever. So tonight, I hope Danny's ideals inspire you to better understand all people of the world and that Thomas Friedman's insights shape some of your clearest thinking. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Friends, colleagues, students, all of you, thank you for being here with us. When, when we took Danny to the airport in 1981, when he was admitted to Stanford, Ruth was very proud, but I cried, because I knew that I'm not going to have my boy anymore. He's not going to be a boy anymore. And when he decided to become a journalist, Ruth was proud again, and I cried. <laughs> what does a journalist do, I ask? They don't create anything new. They don't even prove a theorem. They don't invent a new gadget. They just take facts from one place and they put it in another place. I don't think Danny appreciated that kind of <laughs> understanding of journalism. And he answered me with something like, it's about time you grow up, you know? The universe is not made of gadgets and theorems. The universe is made of people, and people want to know the facts. I, at the first memorial ceremony after Danny's death, there was a Catholic bishop by the name of David Newhouse who made an interesting observation. What is the modern equivalent of a biblical prophet? He asked the journalist. Isn't the prophet like the journalist, one who mediates reality to us? Can Daniel the prophet and Daniel the journalist bear a similar message to us. When I first heard about this comparison, I said, wait, it's too far-fetched. A journalist and a prophet. Just imagine you know, a prophet Isaiah getting the Pulitzer Prize on a Temple Mount. <laughs> that makes sense. But then I thought more about it. Who broke the news? to the resident of Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded the country from the north. The 
prophet. And who was jailed in the time of Jeremiah for reporting unpleasant news? The prophet. And who serves today as the moral compass of society and like the ancient prophets, risk his life for calling things by their names, for exposing corruption, institutional injustice, ineptness, terrorism, and fanaticism. The journalists. Dear Tom, if you hear me, I know you did not fly to California to be ordained as a biblical prophet. Still, considering your enormous influence on our society, your insightful ideas, your prophetic writings, I'm sure that Father Newhouse would join us and would agree that if any journalist deserves that title, you are the one. So thank you, Tom, for honoring Danny's memory with your lecture tonight. Thank you, Howard, Karen, Yuda, for your very moving stories. We're all so grateful that you can all join us here today to honor the memory of Daniel Pearl and the legacy he's left behind. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our host, our guest, uh, Mr. Thomas Friedman. He has won six best, he's written six best-selling books. He's won three Pulitzer Prizes. He started off in 1979 in Beirut and then has been with the New York Times since 1981. Uh, so if we can please have a, a round of applause for this man. Thank you so much. I'd also like to introduce my fellow panelists. First of all, we have Eliana Nejaro, who is graduating this year from the Communications Department. She has interned at the Washington Post. She will be interning at the New York Times and is also the Daniel Pearl Memorial Intern. Um, so, thank you, Eliana. <laughs> Caroline Keller Lynn to my left is a JD MBA at Stanford. She did her undergrad at Yale, and we forgive her for it. Uh, <laughs> after Yale, she uh, served in the Israeli Defense Forces. She was a liaison to the Egyptian military, and she's back here at Stanford. So, we're very excited to have her as well. So, one more round of applause. And Finally, I'm Aaron Zellinger. I'll be kind of the MC for the night. I am a junior undergrad. As you can tell, I'm a little nervous. I haven't had so many people in front of me since my bar mitzvah. And so it's quite a pleasure to be here. Without further ado, let's move over to Ileana, who will be beginning with uh, uh, some questions related to the ethics of journalism and the, the, the situation that journalists face today. Because it's not, as we heard from the introductions, a very easy one since Daniel Pearl. A lot, of, a lot has happened. Uh, just for a general outline of the evening, we'll begin with uh, three series of 20-minute questions from all three of the panelists. Then we'll move to a Q&A for 20 to 30 minutes, and that'll uh, conclude the evening. So if you'd like to uh, participate, and we really hope you will, please um, ask one of the attendants who will be coming around for an index card. You can write down your questions on the index card, pass it to them, and uh, they'll be filtering through those questions and eventually bring them up to us for that 20-minute Q&A. Uh, so let's uh, get it started, Ileana. Thank you. All right, um, figured we could start the evening off with a bit more context of our speaker. So Tom, if you could please tell us a little more about how you got into journalism in the first place. Well, first of all, thank you very much um, uh, for agreeing to do Meet the Press here. Um, uh, we, <laughs> we decided to, to do this format um, where we could uh, bring Stanford students and, and make it part of a dialogue. So thank you three for, for agreeing to do this. Um, uh, Judah, thank you for your kind words and uh, for, for you uh, and your wife uh, honoring me by asking me to give this lecture tonight. Um, I also want to acknowledge my friends George and Charlotte Schultz are here. For those of you who don't know, my wife and I uh, created a travel scholarship at the Hillel for any Stanford student, a race, creed, or color who wants to 
spend a summer studying in the Middle East, uh, in Israel, um, anywhere. Uh, it's a wonderful travel fellowship, and the, the Schultzes have matched it. And we, we're on our fourth class now, and we're very proud of it. And um, applications are available. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I got into journalism basically. I uh, up to age 15, I actually wanted to be a professional golfer, and um, uh, <laughs> I was. I did caddy for Chichi Rodriguez in the U.S. Open. That was as close as I got to um, to a professional golf. But in uh, in 10th grade of high school, my parents took me uh, to Israel uh, over a winter break. Uh, my older sister was studying at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I'm from Minnesota. I had actually never been out of the state of Minnesota, except for a few brief summer forays into Wisconsin. And um, I had also never been on an airplane. Um, and so that was my first trip, uh, basically, and uh, landed in Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, maybe had the first trip been to Greece, uh, I'd, I'd be a Greek scholar today, uh, China, I'd be a sinologist, but I landed there and uh, was, was immediately taken um, by the Middle East. Uh, and I actually ended up living on a kibbutz in Israel all three summers of high school after that. And so when I started college, which was at, actually started at the University of Minnesota, I started taking Arabic as a freshman. Um, and uh, I eventually did a semester at the American University in Cairo and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I had a Marshall Scholarship and I eventually got a graduate degree from uh, Oxford in Arabic and Middle East Studies. So I had a kind of classic British Arabist education. And um, my first year in England, though, I, I, in high school, I was on my high school newspaper. And um, I wrote occasionally for my college paper. But I really got my start in journalism because uh, my first year in London, I was at the School of Oriental and African Studies before I went up to, London, to Oxford. And I then met my then girlfriend, uh, now wife, who had graduated from Stanford in three years and told her father he owed her a year of school. And um, so uh, Anne went to the London School of Economics, and we were introduced there by mutual friends. Um, and uh, in, uh, this was 1975, and Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford for president. And um, we were walking down the street in London one day, and as you know, the Evening Standard always has this blaring headline, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished, you know, kind of thing to get you to buy the Evening Standard. And we were walking down the street, and this is literally how I got my start in journalism. The, the blaring headline on the Evening Standard newsstand said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. So Jimmy Carter was running for president against Gerald Ford. He was clearly trying to win Jewish votes by promising, as I noted to Anne, to fire the first ever Jewish Secretary of State. Um, and I thought that was really kind of odd. Um, and I thought about it, and I have no idea what possessed me, but um, I went back to my dorm room and I wrote a column about it. And um, my then girlfriend, now wife, who is from Des Moines, Iowa, uh, took it home on uh, vacation break and gave it to Gilbert Cranberg, who was then the editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register. And he liked it, and he printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with an Outh cartoon. And they paid me $50. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I was walking down the street. I had an opinion. I wrote it up, and someone paid me $50. So during my time in London and at Oxford, I wrote op-ed pieces for the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, my hometown paper, and the Des Moines Register. When I graduated, I applied at AP and UPI in London. Uh, AP said, you've never covered a fire. You've never covered a city hall meeting. Uh, please go away. And um, uh, UPI, being kind of Avis to AP's hurt, said, well, you've never covered a fire or city hall meeting, but you've written these op-ed pieces about the Middle East. The Iranian Revolution just happened. That Arabic stuff, those letters look a lot like those letters in Persian. Um, uh, we'll, we'll hire you and take a chance. And so they hired me. I started on Fleet Street in 1978. Um, and uh, um, they trained me to be a journalist, really. Uh, and after 11 months there, the number two man in the Beirut Bureau got shot by a man robbing a jewelry store on Hamra Street. And uh, you asked how I got into this. And so he said, I want to get out of here. I do not want to pass go. I do not want to collect $200. Get me out of here. And um, uh, they came to me and said, would you like to go to Beirut? And um, <laughs> uh, we said, sure. It was the middle of the Civil War. And uh, we were there for two years, a um, little over two years. Then the New York Times hired me. They sent me back to Beirut. And the rest was sort of what I've been doing since. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So now. 
In the context of this talk and what our previous speakers have already touched upon, since your days of reporting as a foreign correspondent, since Daniel Pearl's days of reporting, um, particularly in the Middle East, it's become increasingly more dangerous for foreign correspondents in that region. With that growing risk in mind, is it still worth it to send foreign correspondents into such regions? Why or why not? Well, that's a really, it's a very good question. Let's go to the next question. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no. That's, a, that's a very, very good question. Um, and something we, we literally wrestle with right now at the New York Times, and it's always a balance of, um, of risk and, and reward in, in journalism. That, that it is important to have journalists abroad, um, I, I can't say enough for that. My motto as a journalist has always been, if you don't go, you don't know. Um, and you, you, you've got to go. You, you've got to work the story. You've got to hear the, the things that, uh, the crazy things sometimes people say and do. And you, you've got to be there for a long time. Um, you know, I've always felt that it, when it was in Jerusalem or, or Beirut, you know, I had to spend the first two years just sort of absorbing the story. And only then could I take it somewhere. Could I decide, I think this is really, you know, what's important or not. So I shudder to think of a world where um, we cannot send people uh, to any part of the world, particularly the Middle East, where we have to rely entirely on, on local reporters um, who can be even in more danger under more pressure. So um, I think to have an informed foreign policy, to have an informed citizenry, um, you know, we need to have uh, a cadre of, of foreign reporters who are looking at things from an American angle. Um, you know, when I think back of being in Beirut in the summer of 1982, when that story was at its very height, um, the Commodore Hotel, which was the press hotel. And I looked around the lobby of the Commodore Hotel in Beirut in the summer of 82. This is who I saw. I saw AP, UPI, Reuters, AFP, and DPA, German Press Agency. I saw Time, Newsweek, US News and World Report. All these all had their own correspondent. I saw ABC, NBC, CBS, I believe CNN, you know, started right around then. Um, I saw reporters from the Miami Herald, Philadelphia Chronicle, Baltimore Sun, Dallas Morning News, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. I was in Beirut two years ago. I looked around the lobby of the Commodore Hotel, and I saw myself in the mirror. There was a time we sent all these local papers, sent their own reporters. And each person took a different slice out of it. And so, the rainbow of information and, and, and perspectives was so multicolored. And now, I believe we, the New York Times, are the only ones who have a Baghdad Bureau um, uh, of American newspapers. And um, so this is a, it's a real problem and it's a real loss. All right. Well, given then your take on the need for foreign correspondence from a variety of American sources, do you think that or should aspects of a reporter's identity be taken into consideration when choosing who to send? For instance, does it make, should a Jewish reporter be sent into a region that is hostile against Jews? Should a woman be sent to a region that is hostile against women? Um, you know, another really important question, which I had to think about a lot, um, because when I joined the New York Times, they had a rule, which is that they never um, sent a Jewish correspondent to Israel. Um, and, uh, and, that, and they'd never sent a Jewish correspondent to the Arab world. So I, first of all, had to persuade UPI to let me do that. Uh, and this was in the middle of a civil war, too. It was not like um, uh, just some normal time. And so I actually thought about it a lot. And um, it came down to me to, what is objectivity? What is objectivity? I really had to defend that you know, to my potential editors. And you know, people tend to confuse objectivity with the juror in a jury trial. Someone who not only has no uh, involvement, but is basically ignorant, a, a blank slate. You know? um, and so hence they think, well, if we want the best, fairest reporter for the Middle East, let's find a non-Jewish person from Montana, and we'll bring them to the Middle East, and um, we'll get the most objective reporting. And um, I think that's harebrained. Um, I actually think that objectivity is a tension, and it's always a tension that's never resolved between understanding and disinterest. 
I cannot possibly write a fair story about you if I don't get inside you and almost look at the world through your eyes. If I don't really go deep. And at the same time, I can't write a fair story about you if I don't maintain some distance. And so it's always a tension. Sometimes I may be a little more understanding on one day of someone. Sometimes I may be more distant. But my argument was always measure me over time by that tension. And therefore, that tension is all you should judge someone on. Not whether they're a woman, not whether they're Arab, not whether they're Muslim, not whether they're Jewish. And I managed to persuade an editor at the New York Times and an editor of UPI that. So I was the first Jewish correspondent they ever sent to the Arab world. And Abe Rosenthal, who was in the editor of the Times, actually wanted to break this rule. So he appointed David Shipler uh, to Israel, not realizing that he wasn't Jewish, he just looked Jewish. And, um, <laughs> uh, and so when, it, when his time was over, they didn't take any chances and, and, and uh, they, they, they sent me. So I really, really believe whether you're a woman, African-American, minority, you should be judged on what you write. And um, I, I feel very, very strongly about that. And, um, and an, another thing I feel strongly about is, is that you should, um, you know, what, what's happened today around journalism everywhere, but particularly in the Middle East, I feel so sorry for my colleague, Jody Rudoran, who's our Jerusalem bureau chief today, because she must have 20 people writing about her for every story she writes, you know, which was not the case you know, when I was there. You didn't have this whole ecosystem of press critics on, on both sides. And um, to the extent that you know, people came to me with those issues, I always said, look, you know, do not judge me on today's story. Maybe I was a little more understanding of one side. Maybe it was a little more distant. I'm, I've been here for a year. I've written 300 stories. If there's a pattern of bias there, then you need to show it to me. But if I didn't satisfy you today, I'm not really interested. And so I think that's really how I judge reporters. That's how I look at the paper, people I read, and that's how I think we should be judged. All right. Now, bringing it back to sort of understanding journalism in terms of the legacy that Daniel Pearl um, left. So Daniel Pearl's writing was often not only a journalistic report of a different region, but it was also a means to learn more about distinct cultures that we may be in the US or not currently facing day to day. Um, and at the same time, a way to remind us that we're all still human beings, that there is some shared human experience. To what degree are foreign correspondents in their coverage of various regions responsible for educating a Western audience about cultures they may not understand? Um, well, again, it's, it's a really interesting to think about. Let me, let me sort of back up and just talk a little bit about my method and, and maybe come into that, because often young people come to me and say, I want to do what you do. Uh, I want to be a journalist. What do I, what do I need to know? You know? And um, I always say, uh, um, well, it's, it's good to be able to type fast. Um, I, can, I can type really fast. In fact, I went to London Secretarial School to learn how to type, so <laughs> my wife will tell you. Um, you should know good grammar and good English and some history and science and technology and philosophy and you should know all those things. But there's actually just one thing I think you need uh, to be, uh, I think, a good journalist. I think Danny had it. Um, I can tell, I, although we didn't know each other, I can tell from his writing. You have to like people. Uh, it's actually amazing to me how many journalists don't like people. Um, but uh, you have to like people because um, what is our job is to unlock people's aspirations, hopes, dreams, fears. And the only way to do that um, is if people open up to you. And they're not going to open up to someone who's hostile to them. And that doesn't mean you have to agree with them all the time. Um, anyone who reads my stuff about Israel or the Arab world knows I'm not there saying you're all wonderful, it's all the other guy's fault. You know, um, uh, but people have to feel that um, you respect them and you want them to succeed. So, I've always said that the single most important attribute, I think, to be a good journalist is you have to be a good listener uh, for two reasons. One is what you hear. But especially in a place like the Middle East, listening is a sign of respect. And if you just listen to people, I don't mean just wait for them to stop talking, but listen to what they have to say, it's amazing what they will let you say back. But if they smell you're not listening, that you really don't care whether they succeed or not, you can't tell them it's dark outside. So uh, I believe these are the real crafts of the trade. Um, uh, and and um, 
And I think if you do that, you do it right, you do it over time, you can unlock you know, so much about a culture and a society, about its hopes and dreams and fears. And that's a big part of what we need to do. Well, Tom, if you don't mind, uh, Please. thank you for that peek behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. um, I'd actually like to move back to an earlier part in your mm -hmm. story. When you began reporting from Beirut in 1979, the PLO in Lebanon and Israel were on a collision course towards some serious conflict. Uh, 30 years later, much has changed, but unfortunately it seems that much is yet the same. Um, just this week, or past week, Hezbollah and Israel have engaged in some border skirmishes that some might fear will lead to another 2006-style conflict. In your mind, what are the significant differences between then and now, both geopolitically and for reporters on the ground? Well, maybe the best way I can answer that question is I wrote a book uh, about my time in Beirut and Jerusalem. It was, came out in 1989. And um, uh, yeah, that was 25 years ago. Um, and uh, my publisher um, kept asking me to update it. And I kept telling him I was going to. It was going to, we were going to put on a new edition. It was going to say updated and revised. And there would be one page update. And it would say, nothing has changed. OK. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, literally the names, I go back to Beirut, and it's Jamal, and it's you know, uh, uh, Jumblat, and it's just the younger. I knew your father, I knew your grandfather, you know. Um, unfortunately, we're actually gone backwards, you know. Um, uh, you know, the tragedy of uh, the breakdown of the Oslo peace process is that um, when there is war, um, you can root for peace. And when there is uh, peace, you can root for a final settlement. Um, but there is nothing worse in the world than war after peace because it just shatters everything. Everybody gets all their hopes and emotions up and they push that rock right up to the top of the hill, in the case of Oslo, even over it, and then it all breaks down. And so to me, Israelis and Palestinians today are a little bit like a couple who have this very stormy courtship for many years. And one day they say, you know what, let's get married. We'll fix everything, we'll get married. You know, they go out and get married and, and unfortunately they both kind of cheat on each other after six months. That marriage will never be the same. And I, I, I fear that something was deeply shattered there. And, and building the confidence to, to re-engage at a deep level uh, is going to be very difficult. Well, touching on that marriage, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and as well the kind of personal element that you're describing, that it, it really is somewhat personalities who drive these events yeah. and, and their coverage of them. Uh, going back to the summer, well, one of the inherent difficulties in journalism seems to be that you have to rely on the people and organizations that you write about to provide you both access and information. Yeah. And in the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, foreign correspondents from India and France and the world over have reported dealing with the same balancing act. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to publish accurate just depictions of the situation on the ground while avoiding the threat of reprisal or expulsion. How have foreign correspondents, and yourself included, traditionally dealt with this problem? Have you ever made such a quid pro quo, and is it ultimately worth this? So I wasn't in Gaza then, so I, I can't speak for that. I can speak of what it was like to be the only Jewish reporter in Beirut in the summer of 82 when the city was ringed by uh, the Israeli army, you know, trying to get in, actually, and eventually, and eventually did. And you know, I always simply took um, refuge in my reporting. Um, uh, but there, there, there was a moment I wrote about in Beirut to Jerusalem where the then PLO spokesman um, told my, my, my driver and personal assistant who had worked for the New York Times since the days of Kim Philby, Mohammed Kasraoui, um, was Palestinian. And just a wonderful, and our stringer, actually our local stringer, Hassan Hijazi, also Palestinian. They'd worked for the New York Times forever. And wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and uh, they, they, at one point, at the height of the summer of 82, they um, uh, communicated to them, but PLO spokesman, that my reporting could be just a little more sympathetic. Um, and so I um, marched down to his office, and uh, I said, uh, Mahmoud, um, I'm Jewish. You know I'm Jewish. You know who I work for. If you have a problem with that, let me know. I'll be on the first taxi out. Otherwise? Let's just move on. 
Do you think that situation has changed? I think it's much more dangerous now. The PLO at that time was a relatively, um, you know, uh, uh, stable, orderly organization. Today, you are dealing um, with a gang, more marauding gangs, and um, you don't know who is on whose side, who is working for who. ISIS now has a basically a department for kidnapping journalists. Um, you know, I was saying, telling someone this the other day when I was in Beirut for UPI. Uh, the UPI office was in the Annahar building, which is the main, the, the leading Arab newspaper in Beirut. It was on Hamra Street. And I very often, as a wire service reporter, I'd either work the morning shift, you know, seven to, you know, to three or whatever, uh, or I'd work the evening shift, which was three till 11 in closing. I used to walk home. Uh, I used to walk home, it was about a mile, you know, I mean, at night in Beirut. I can't believe I did that. Um, uh, and um, I told a story in, in what happened one night. Actually, Ann and I were out a movie, and we were walking home after the movie, and a man jumped out a window um, right onto the sidewalk like a cat in front of us uh, with a bag in one hand and a gun in the other, and he looked at us, and we looked at him, and, um, and we marched on. Um, uh, he scampered off, and that was it. So I did some crazy stuff, but um, right at the end um, of my time there, was the beginning of this decline. Um, two things basically happened. Um, one day, the Iraqi embassy got blown up. Uh, this is in um, uh, this was in 1983, um, and uh, someone said that it was a suicide bomber who detonated his car in the garage under the Iraqi embassy. We just heard this in Beirut. We all sort of put it out of our minds because Iran and Iraq were at war then. Um, short time later, in April 1983, um, uh, I believe it was April 18th, um, I, had, uh, I was in my apartment. It was 1.06 um, p.m. I had, uh, I had something on my desk called a transistor radio. Um, it's a small device that emitted a sound. And... Um, uh, um, and uh, at 1.06 p.m., a blast happened that was so powerful, it knocked the radio off my desk onto the floor. And now when a blast like that would happen in Beirut, you never knew whether it was an uh, Israeli plane setting off a sonic boom or something worse. And so you have to, um, you wait a minute and you, you wait to hear if there are sirens. That tells you it's not a sonic boom. Sirens came immediately. I ran down from my apartment, which was in Manara, and um, down Rublis, and uh, I, I started to see a mushroom cloud snaking up uh, in the distance. And as I got closer, I said, no, it couldn't be. No, 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 it, it couldn't be. And then I turned the corner, and there was the US Embassy in Beirut, uh, cut in half like a doll's house, uh, in flames, basically, bodies hanging out. and. Um, it was such a shocking scene. And um, I managed to get a hold of an embassy staffer, and I don't remember exactly when, at what time, it was too long ago, whether it was then or hours later, but I'll never forget what he told me. He said a man drove a pickup truck up the front steps of the embassy into the front lobby and blew it up. And I never forget what I said. I said, you mean he blew himself up. He committed suicide. It was just, to this kid from Minnesota, it was just the most unbelievable thing. Little did I know that was the first of a phenomena that I would be covering basically for the rest of my career. And um, a short time later, Terry Anderson uh, of the AP got kidnapped, um, and Jerry Levin of CNN, who lived one floor below us, or above us, and, um, uh, and so it started to really fray. And, um, and fortunately, after that, I left Beirut. It, it seems like you really witnessed some of the major pivot points of history. Um, it's interesting, because you're describing this, this scenario from when you were covering it from the perspective of a journalist. And when we discuss journalists and columnists, we tend to think of them as purely observers to phenomena on the ground. Um, but Tom, your work has at times propelled events on the ground. 
and form part of the defining history of the contemporary mm -hmm. Middle East. When you broke the story of the Arab Peace Initiative in, in 2002, for example, you, you really transcended the role of a journalist and became more of a, a regional player and shaper. Can you tell us a little bit about that side of the experience? Um, so in, uh, I, I go every year to the Davos World Economic Forum and, and in 2001, because of what happened on 9-11, the Davos people decided to hold Davos in New York City, in honor of New York City. And um, uh, obviously it's post 9-11, it's a terrible wrenching time. And I at the time would occasionally do columns of um, where I would uh, pretend I was the president sending a letter to a foreign leader. I, I did them under Clinton and I really got his voice right and I caused a lot of trouble. It was great fun, okay? Because all the foreign leaders were sure it came from the White House, you know? And um, Clinton had in fact once diverted a trip to Africa to go to Cairo to explain to Mubarak that it was not him, you know? Uh, and, um, but I, I, I had a hard time getting George Bush's voice right, you know? And it was just so, but I did one uh, right after, uh, shortly after 9-11 in which I, I wrote a column from George Bush to the uh, Arab League um, and to specifically the king of uh, then Crown Prince of Dhulab, Saudi Arabia, King of Jordan. And, um, uh, but this is how it happened. I went to Davos and I was thinking about this all the time, that what if somebody tried to break the logjam by putting out an Arab peace plan that simply said full peace for full withdrawal, normalization trade, everything for full withdrawal. And um, I ran into, so I was thinking about this before I got to Davos uh, in New York, and I ran into Andre Azoulay, who was a Moroccan uh, Jewish senior advisor to the King of Morocco, whom I had known over the years and visited in Morocco. And I said, Andre, I'm thinking of putting out a phony letter from Bush to the Arab League. Did, what do you think of that? He said, I think that's a good idea. Do it. So I um, then um, uh, ran into Amr Moussa, who is the head of the Arab League. And um, uh, we were just, I just saw him a few weeks ago, and we were reminiscing about this. And I said, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think of that? He said, you should do that. And then I saw him a few hours later, and he said, he pulled me aside, he said, are you gonna do that? So I thought, oh, okay, I think I'll do that. Um, so I went and wrote a phony column, I mean, a phony letter in a column from George Bush to the head of the Arab League, saying this is what you guys should do. You should put out an Arab peace plan an Arab peace initiative gone for full peace, full withdrawal, full normalization. So after 9-11, um, uh, I was extremely hard on Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, I believed that uh, the Wahhabi ideology was complicit in, in um, not to mention the number of Saudis on the planes. And I, I, I went after them hammer and tong. And um, no doubt in an effort to soften you know, me up, they invited me to Saudi Arabia. I, where I'd, I'd been traveling with the Secretary of State, but never been, you know. And so uh, in February, right after this column, I went to Saudi Arabia. And um, uh, I got to go with the oil minister down to the empty quarter. I got to meet the minister of religious affairs. I had some amazing encounters. And then um, in the middle of the trip, uh, Adel Joubert, who was then the assistant to the ambassador in Washington, he's now the Saudi ambassador in Washington, um, said um, the Crown Prince Abdullah would like to see you at his ranch um, outside of Riyadh. And um, so we went there, um, like dinner started at 11 at night or something. I just remember we sat around for a long time. Huge buffet. Um, Adel had me come sit next to him on his chair and just sort of introduce myself. I gave him an Arabic edition of Lexus the Olive Tree and we talked about things. Then he asked me to sit with him for dinner. So we had, there was a giant TV screen in front of him and um, all these princes and others around, and I sat next to him, and we just watched TV. And um, <laughs> said, okay, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen here. Um, and at midnight, he said, uh, come on over to the house. So uh, he and I and Otto um, sat around a little desk, just the three of us, there was nobody else there. And um, he began by saying, um, you broke into my drawer. And I said, what do you mean, your highness? Um, that peace plan you offered, that was my idea. I had that idea, you broke into my drawer. I said, well, that's very interesting. How would you describe it, you know? And so he then laid it all out, and over the next three hours, we talked about different permutations of it. And um, at three in the morning, um, uh, this finally broke up, and I said, I would like to write a comp about this. 
this plan I stole from you. Um, and he said, oh, no, it's a, you just put it out on background or whatever. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, you put it on the record. He said, no, 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 you, you just put it out uh, 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 in your voice. I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and uh, in fact, we were standing, because I still can kind of see the scene sort of going back and forth on this. And um, finally, he said, you write it up. You write up the quotes you want to use. <clears throat> and we'll look at it. So, excuse me, I went back to my hotel. I wrote them all up. I uh, used something called a fax machine to um, fax them uh, <laughs> to Adel the next afternoon. And um, Adel called back and said, they're yours, go with it. So I thought, this is really exciting. But I called Adel back. And I said, Adel, I, and does he know what he's saying? Because I don't, I don't want to be in one of these, you know, um, does he know what he's saying? Uh, and message came back, he absolutely knows. So this was on a Wednesday, and my column had to go in Friday night for Sunday. And then some really funky stuff happened. Because I went to see Crown Prince, then uh, Prince Nayef, the Minister of Interior, and um, his brother. You know, I sat down, and I was just about to say, wow, your brother, man, he's like, really? And I, I forgot what happened that tipped me off that he had no idea. Then I went to see the Minister of Information, and he had no idea. So I thought, there's a little bit of a coup d'etat going on here. Because King Fahd was, in, he was basically out of it. Abdullah was just crown prince, and he was making a bid. So the column... Um, Sort of, I turned in Friday, it's going on Sunday, they gave me extra space for it. I did call Adel and say one thing. This is from experience in the Middle East. Adel, I'm staying here till Monday for one reason and one reason only, to see how you write this up in Arabic on the Saudi press agency. And if you don't write it up, I put it in a little more colorful terms, um, uh, exactly the way it is, remember, I have a Wednesday column. OK? So because um, uh, all I cared about was not I knew it was going to be in the New York Times. Yeah. I cared about what the Saudi press agency said in Arabic. Saturday night, they called me and said, um, do you have Ari Fleischer's phone number? And I said, uh, he was then President Bush's spo uh, spokesman. I said, don't you people have an embassy in Washington? And I never forget, they said, we're not using the embassy. Uh oh, this is getting really interesting. Okay, <laughs> so the story came out, and um, uh, and it, you know, exploded, and and the Arab world um, uh, decided to call a summit meeting to um, basically um, concretize it. They made a few changes. I deliberately didn't go to that summit in Beirut because I, my attitude was I really laid low. I said I've done my part. This is only going to go as far as Saudi Arabia takes it. And I'm, so I'm not going to be out there hyping it or whatever. You look at this, look at my, no, is it only going to go as far as they take it? And over the years, I tried several times to persuade um, then King Abdullah, who just passed away, to freshen it up. Um, but I, I never could. So given. So that's how it happened. No, it's, it's a fascinating yeah. story. Um, kind of given how divided it was within Saudi Arabia and contentious at that time, and that King Abdullah just passed, what do you think the fate of the Arab Peace Initiative or another Arab League-led initiative would be? Uh, it's a, that's a good question, too. And I, I really don't know, because we, we, we now don't have five of those states who voted for it. Libya doesn't exist really as a coherent state. Yemen doesn't. Iraq doesn't. Syria doesn't. Um, and uh, uh, so um, I guess it's four. But I, I um, you know, it still is the only you know, agreed Arab Peace Plan, as you know, um, Israelis, there's a, there's a whole foundation in Israel that's trying to persuade the government to um, uh, uh, take it up. One of my disappointments was neither the Bush administration nor the Sharon government jumped on it. They all poked around at it, but nobody really jumped on it. And, um, uh, but now there's, there's a group of Israeli generals. Shimon Peres has called for the revival of it. So it's still there because it's the only agreed upon Arab peace initiative. And it will be the only foundation for any peace agreement. Um, and given that you're so good at taking the voice of world leaders and going to put you in, in the mindset once again, um, the upcoming visit of Israeli 
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's got to go now. Um, <laughs> sorry. So uh, we're, I think we're at the end now. <laughs> it, it, it'll be short. It'll be short. Um, just referencing your column on Wednesday. Yeah. You said that Netanyahu, who's coming to the U.S. to speak directly to the Congress, kind of behind Obama's back, um, as well as, as Boehner and their counterparts, are living in their own self-contained bubble. How has this bubble affected the realities on the ground with respect to both the Palestinians and Iran, and should we expect this bubble to burst anytime soon? Well, you know, I hope it isn't burst by um, the outside, but, you know, there's... You know, you can at some point, um, to put this in market terms, you can suppress a lot of market signals. You know, and Israel, for you know, complicated reasons that have to do with you know, campaign finance and, and politics in America, you know, it's kind of as wall-to-wall -wall support you know, in, in the Congress. And um, as I've noted, what would happen if Prime Minister Netanyahu said, I'm not gonna speak at the Congress, I'm gonna go to the University of Wisconsin what would happen on that campus? Guarantee it would not be a standing ovation um, 22 times that he got last time he was in Congress. So if you never get out of the bubble and actually feel the trends that are alive today on college campuses, including this one, um, uh, it's very, very dangerous. So I, I just think this is a colossally bad idea. I think it's an insult to our president. We have one president at a time, Democrat or Republican. We have a tradition that a foreign leader only comes here at the invitation of our president. Um, so this was mischief making from the very beginning. And then to do it two weeks before the Israeli election, to in effect use our Congress as a backdrop for a standing ovation for Israeli campaign commercials is offensive to me. Um, and most importantly to me, um, you know, I think Iran getting a nuclear weapon is a very dangerous thing. It may require in the future some very difficult decisions by the United States government. Um, and the president's always left that open you know, in terms of use of force if he has to. What have we learned about the Middle East uh, in the last decade? We've learned that the use of force always ends up really messy. Really, really messy. And if, if we do have to go down that road and this ends up messy, and a lot of people say, how did we get into this? And they trot out film footage of Netanyahu at the Congress in engineering a situation where diplomacy couldn't work anymore, that's a place Israel should be a million miles away from. That is so short-sighted and reckless to me. Um, and so for all those reasons, I just think it's a colossally bad idea. Israel needs to have bipartisan support in this country. And if, if Israel becomes just a Republican slash conservative issue, and if we're at the beginning of that fork, that would be a terrible, terrible tragedy. To follow up on that, Tom, I want to ask you about the extent to which you believe uh, Bibi is acting out of a sincere belief that the Obama administration is not going to make do on its promise to stop the Iranian nuclear program. To what extent is this an issue of American credibility versus Israeli political forces at play? So it's a very, it's a good question, but it's, a, it's such a complicated question because the thing we have to remember most is there's a huge debate inside Israel on this issue. We have had the former heads of the Mossad, former chiefs of staff, come out and say this is a, Israel using military force against Iran is a terrible idea. That we're going to get rained on with missiles. The, uh, uh, the potential for success of sort of one mission, it would be a multi-day operation. Then if you, even if you succeed, then Iran is free to just, they're gonna make a rush to a bomb. Do we keep then bombing Iran every six months? So this, it's not like Netanyahu is coming to Washington representing the consensus of the Israeli national security establishment. He has huge opposition from sitting and former heads of Mossad in the military. And so uh, I, I think we need to keep all of that really in mind, you know, as, as, we, as we judge this. My focus right now is to hope, um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical, but it's to hope that somehow you can get a diplomatic solution that will satisfy um, uh, a realist, a realistic um, uh, person that you can, you can set Iran back um, for, you know, uh, a, a considerable period of time. Um, if that doesn't happen, we have only bad choices because it's either going to live with a bomb or live with a military solution because it's very likely the sanctions will break down. And I hope we don't have to come to that situation.
push back on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, to what extent do you think the Israelis uh, are, are confident in the Americans' ability to make do on that promise? I mean, it, there seems to be, and perhaps I'm completely wrong on this, yeah. a consensus, consensus in Israel after 2011 with the red lines that, hey, maybe President Obama is not going to make do on his promise. Mm -hmm. Is that the general It's a perfectly belief? legitimate position. And if you're Israel and you now, I mean, Israel, um, uh, you know, I think we, we also have to keep in mind, Israel is like a, a lab experiment. It's surrounded by non-state actors dressed in civilian uniforms, armed with missiles, nested among civilians. Sinai, Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria, out of four out of five borders. So I don't, I don't blame the Israelis for being skeptical about anyone's security guarantee, and, and they shouldn't be. Um, I just don't think it's an either or question because Hezbollah has tens of thousands of rockets in Lebanon, which they've made very clear. Hezbollah now, it's, it's very clear, is nothing but the cat's paw of Iran. If it was ever an independent militia, we now know from the Syrian civil war, it is nothing but an extension of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Those rockets are going to rain down all over Israel. Um, and think of the destruction that will be caused. So this will not be like we take their missile out and then we put our feet up um, or their nuclear program up. This is a hellish scenario, which we should do everything to avoid. Israelis should do everything. And I think there are a lot of people in there who want to avoid it. At the same time, Iran getting a nuclear weapon, that will be the end of the nuclear nonproliferation regime. And to think that Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia would all then get a bomb in this incredibly unstable tinderbox region um, is really, really a frightening thought. So, you know, my, my feeling is this, is this is a time for allies to really be collaborating, really working close together, overcoming even mistrust. Because if this breaks down, um, it's going to be terrible for Israel either way. It'll either be living with an Iranian bomb or in an ongoing war with Iran. And Iran's a big country, okay? Um, and it has considerable, you know, military power. Uh, so this is a time for working together and not for, for anybody, either side, you know, grandstanding. To shift gears from Israel to France for a little bit, Charlie Hebdo and the fallout that occurred after, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, if the attacks revealed anything, it was more than the antipathy of the, the terrorists who carried them out. It was the problem we have in the media and in general governance in addressing issues of religion. Uh, for example, the New York Times just made an editor editorial decision not to publish the uh, Char Charlie Hebdo, I'm working on my French accent here, um, mm -hmm. the, the cartoons of Mohammed, whereas yeah. the Telegraph published the cartoons, blurred out the face, and put it next to a hook-nosed Jew caricature, mm. and did not blur that out. Yeah. So, so what considerations really go into this decision-making process on the editorial board of somewhere like the New York Times? You've been there. Um, and, uh, why does it even matter when we can all go online See it anyways, yeah. Yeah, and look at the cartoons ourselves? Well, our editor, you know, this is also, you know, I'm on the editorial side of the paper, and we have a big wall between the editorial side and the news side, so this is not a, it was not a decision for, for our side of the paper. It was a news decision. And our editor, Dean Becquet, felt that um, he did not want to do anything that was going to upset our Muslim readers. Um, and, I, and I think it was a 51-49 call. And um, that's the, that was the decision he made. I, I respect it. it. In my own column, you know, I am not for gratuitously insulting anybody. You know, um, and uh, so I, I understood where Charlie Hebdo was coming from. You know, but it, that's not not my thing. I, I respect their right to do that, and certainly um, would defend their right to do that. But um, you know, I, I prefer to myself get in trouble in other ways. You know, um, so. Building along that idea yeah. of uh, straddling the line between insulting and yeah. uh, freedom of speech, sure. if, you, if you will. Um, so the Obama administration has come under a lot of flack recently. You wrote about this in a column, Say It As, uh, what was it called? Say It As, Say it, it, as is. it Is. Yes. So uh, they're unwilling to call extremists who carried out these attacks Muslim extremists, right? And perhaps one could argue that that is skirting the underlying issue, which is an unwillingness to deal with this uh, plague of extremism within the Muslim community. So to, to what extent, you, you, you touched on this subject, but didn't really you know, go too in depth as to how specifically, not, uh, how specifically not addressing the Muslim nature of the extremist problem in this sense 
harms the attempts for modernization within, mm. or secularization perhaps, within the, the Muslim world. Can you go into depth a little bit about exactly what we're giving up by not calling this problem a Muslim extremist problem? Well, first of all, this is a very complicated uh, set of issues, and so I try to deal with it in, as best I can in its full complexity. As a matter of course, though, I do not believe we should be in the business of telling Muslims what their religion is or isn't. Um, so I kind of recoil from anyone who says it's all this, or anyone who says it's, it's not any of that. You know, uh, I think we should be in the business of asking them, okay, why is this happening? We don't know. We have many, many, an overwhelming number of Muslims who are American citizens living in this country um, and who are wonderful citizens. So we don't have this problem. So maybe you could explain it to me. But I, I sort of recoil at anyone sitting back and saying that, who's not a Muslim, saying that's not Islam. What the hell do you know what Islam is? Oh, I read the Quran in college, okay? You don't know anything, okay? And that's not our job, it seems to me. So the way I've written about it is that obviously this is emerging from their faith community. But first of all, it's not emerging from across their faith community. It's not a problem in Indonesia, the world's biggest Muslim country. It's not a problem in India, the world's second biggest Muslim country. We're talking about a problem that's clearly been emerging from the Arab world and Pakistan primarily. Um, now what is that about? I think it's a really complicated mix of um, the product of years of authoritarian government, um, mixing with uh, the export of Wahhabi puritanical Islam from Saudi Arabia all over that world that has really leached out the more open, joyous, synchronistic Islam that you had in Egypt. You look at pictures of graduates of Cairo University in 1950, you'll see none of the women are wearing veils. Today you look at the picture and probably most of the women will be wearing veils. Thank you, Saudi Arabia, okay? That is a product of the export of a brand, of a particular brand of Islam um, uh, from Saudi Arabia with the wealth of that country. And that's mixed also just with youth bulge, unemployment. And so where Islam starts in that story and authoritarian begins and there is how much these people hate their own governments, bleeding into you know, Wahhabism, you know, bleeding into massive amounts of young men who have never held power, because they're not allowed to in their country, never held a job, and never held a girl's hand. And when you have lots of young males who have never held power, a job, or a girl's hand, that is real dynamite. And so I like to talk about it in its, the full complexity. But I also, I don't want to excuse it. You know, I don't, we need to have a serious conversation, but we should be in the business of asking them, not excusing them and not accusing everyone. But we need to understand there's a pattern here. This is not happening in Norway. It's not happening in Sweden. You know, I mean, you can talk about the Crusades in the 13th century. We're not living in the 13th century anymore, okay? Um, and personally, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Uh, it's very hard, I think, for us to get into someone else's narrative. Only they can get into that narrative. And um, we need to leave it to them. But I, th I think it is important to ask, to probe, and to challenge in a serious way and stop telling them who they are. Thank you. And there's a new narrative on this campus, and that is one of divestment from companies that are allegedly aiding the occupation uh, in Israel of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. um, now, you've been fairly critical of Israel in your tenure as a columnist. Uh, I've been fairly critical of certain Israeli policies by certain Israeli governments. Exactly. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> Yitzhak Rabin would never, Shimon Peres would never tell you I was critical of Israel. Yeah. <laughs> Depends who's in power and what their policies are. My grandparents, however, might say yeah. that. In fact, so, they, they wonder yeah. aloud, you know, yeah. is, this, is this Thomas Friedman guy, is he really mm -hmm. pro-Israel, anti-Israel? Mm -hmm. But uh, I would tell you, if you came here onto this campus and saw the black and white rhetoric that is occurring, uh, you would realize that your criticism sounds more like Hatikva huh. than it does of... Yeah. Um, Criticism of Israel. That's chilling. Ne <laughs> Next week, um, there will be a vote on this campus as to whether or not the ASSU Senate will divest from these companies. 
I, I want to ask you about your opinion on the overall divestment and boycott movement and whether or not it is progressing forward toward a two-state solution, whether it's compatible with a two-state solution, or whether this is a diversion, an attempt to blame uh, one side of the conflict or another. Well, I'll just tell you how I approach the whole issue generally. You know, um, uh, ever since I first woke up to this problem when I was 15, I've actually believed uh, the same thing, you know, which is that um, Israelis will never be at home and be able to take off their shoes unless Palestinians can. Palestinians will never be at home really able to take off their shoes unless Israelis can. So I've been for a two-state solution ever since I've been for anything. And my view is very simple. There is a, actually a very good, fair, just plan on the table. It's called the Clinton you know, Peace Initiative parameters. Uh, Israel withdraws from 95% of the West Bank. Um, it's able to keep 80% of the settlements, which are on 5% of the West Bank, and then gives Palestinians 5% of Israel in compensation. So it's a 100% deal. Israel withdraws from Arab neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. They become under Palestinian sovereignty and retains Jewish neighborhoods of, of East Jerusalem. A symbolic number of refugees return, and there's compensation for the others. If you are for that plan, you are my friend. If you are not for that plan, you are not my friend. I don't care whether you're the prime minister of Israel, settler leader, the BDS you know, um, uh, community on this campus, or any other. Because if you're for anything other than that plan, you're not for peace in this part of the world. And so um, I'm, my, my view on, on um, that's, that's, I would say, num number, number one. Number two, um, it's no, you know, no secret. I mean, I, um, I would fight the BDS movement as if there are no settlements. And I will oppose the settlements as if there's no BDS movement, okay? Because both are making mischief to me. Both are undermining the possibility of a two-state solution. And so I'm not for divestment, I'm for investment. Tell me that you're gonna invest in seeds of peace. Tell me you're gonna invest in the new Israel fund. Tell me you're gonna invest in, there's actually a few now, uh, funds in Israel that are actually Israeli and Palestinian uh, tech uh, collaborations together. Tell me you're gonna, what you're gonna invest in, okay? Because we really have enough people meddling in this issue, um, and, and no good whatsoever will, will come from it. And on, on, on a simple you know, moral basis, you know, I, I, it just, here you have Assad dropping barrel bombs on people, killed 200,000 people. Saudi Arabia is currently lashing, 50 lashes every week, although they've stopped because the world you know, found it so abhorrent, a young blogger calling for Islamic reform. Uh, Sisi's government in Egypt, they've, they've killed a lot of people and jailed a lot of people who are liberals, Democrats, progressives, and students like people on this campus. Tell me you've got a BDS movement for all of them, then I'll look at this one, okay? But why are you, why only here? I only hear, you know what I mean? So, um, and at the same time, you know, um, to your grandparents, um, uh, I don't work for the Jewish press, okay, or the Jewish week. Um, I work for the New York Times. I call it as I see it on both sides. And, and I believe the settlements beyond the, uh, the, the peace map that Israel has engaged in and continues to engage in could well lead to the death of Israel as a Jewish democracy. And I'm as opposed to that as much as I'm opposed to people who want to destroy Israel in another way. So please tell your grandparents, I love Israel, but I believe in tough love. I think tough love is the only true love. So with that, I think we're gonna to move to some Q&A. Let's see. Let's see here. Go for it, please. Um, By the way, you guys were great. Really, I give them a hand. So let's let's dovetail off that last answer. Um, you've clearly stated what Israel should do to achieve a two-state peaceful solution, but you've said very little of what the Palestinian leadership, in particular Abbas, should do. Why is it so hard for them to say two states for two people? And, and what I'll add is, um, what do you think they should be yeah. doing? 
Well, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a perfectly legitimate question. Um, and Abbas has actually, uh, I'm not going to defend everything he's done, because he's actually turned down the Omer peace plan. You know, um, uh, he has a lot to answer for uh, himself. Here's what I think Palestinians should be doing. And if you're, if you're thinking in terms of, of um, you know, where, where the BDS community is coming from, if you want to boycott Israel, um, if you want to boycott Israeli goods from the West Bank, um, if you want to have a hunger strike, uh, all of those to me are nonviolent, are perfectly legitimate on one condition. You wrap it with a map of what you think a proper two-state solution should look like. And so a kind of a Iraq, uh, a opposition, divestment that doesn't come with a map, to me, is, is only going to actually reinforce the worst trends um, and, and the most opposition in Israel. I would say the exact same thing for Israelis. And it's enormously frustrating to me that the Netanyahu government still won't put a peace map on the table. And so, you know, with, with, without a map, um, uh, no pressure, whatever form it takes, violent or nonviolent, um, it's only going to actually reinforce uh, the worst trends. You know, one of the hardest things, I think, for people who write about Israel to um, appreciate is that you have to actually keep three thoughts in your head at the same time, uh, I think, when you write about Israel. Um, thought number one is Israel is an amazing place. What, what Israel has built in, you know, 60-odd years um, in terms of science and technology, um, in terms of literature and society, Israel is an amazing place. Number two, Israel does some bad stuff sometimes. Uh, and the occupation and the settlements are at the head of that parade. And number three, Israel lives in a crazy neighborhood that's gotten even crazier in the last few years. Now, when I cover Israel, I, I, I have all three of those swimming in my head. And unfortunately, most of the, the, the Greek chorus out there either says, it's an amazing place. It does bad stuff. It lives in a crazy neighborhood, don't ever ask. You have to keep all three in tension at your head, in your head at the same time. You do that, you also, you know, you'll, Israelis will respect you as a journalist. But if you just come with one of those three, they really won't. Well, going into that, I wanted to ask, in particular, um, you know, in coverage of the Middle East, and just in general even, do you think that the quality of US journalism has improved or declined over time? And what role has social media and citizen journalism, particularly from citizens of other countries, how has that played a role in affecting the quality of these reports? So I have one rule, which is I never make generalizations about Middle East reporting. I can answer, I'll answer a question about my own, but not anybody else's. So, and I haven't been following the trend particularly. Uh, so let me take the second part of that question, which is uh, social media, is a, it, it's, a, it's quite amazing. I mean, the number of, there's some amazing Arab bloggers today who I have really come to rely on um, uh, in Egypt, out of Syria, uh, this guy in Saudi Arabia now, men and women um, who are able to use the internet now as a way to get their voice out. And so um, at a time when we, fewer and fewer Western reporters can go to some of these places now, at least we have these voices unlocked. It's a, it's a huge resource. Well, I'll, I'll give you a question that actually this, this merges quite nicely with a paper I have to write this week. Um, <laughs> do you think that the war on terror is possible to win? Um, uh, she wanted to know when my book will be out, and um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for asking, really. It's just, uh, it'll be in the spring. Um, uh, no, can we win the war on terror, you know? Um, gosh, you know, it's, um, th this has just been such a hellish problem, and we've really tried everything, you know? In, in a way, we, we tried invasion. Um, in Iraq, uh, we tried decapitation in Libya, and we tried abdication in Syria, um, and none of them worked, you know. And so where I am in my own head right now um, is I'm for what I call containment and amplification, okay? When I think of the ISIS problem, I'm for, 
using our military and, and allied military to make sure ISIS doesn't spread to other islands of decency, Jordan, Kurdistan, Lebanon. That we have a real interest in, UAE, uh, and, and even Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Um, but uh, I'm only for amplifying what they do. Um, uh, if there's one thing I've learned from this whole experience is that um, if they don't own the problem and own the solution, nothing we do will be self-sustaining. And um, the two most important words I've learned in foreign policy are self and sustaining. There's no country we can't occupy, no, no government we can't topple. But at the end of the day, what I've learned from this whole period is we can stop bad things from happening, but we do not have the power to make good things happen. Only they do. And um, uh, way, way too often, um, I've sort of come to the view of any sentence that begins, I, we, or us, about the Middle East is a bad sentence. Um, that it's got to start with them. Um, and when the Middle East only puts a smile on your face, when it starts with them. The Anbar uprising started with them. We reinforced it, okay? Um, the uh, uh, Oslo started with Israelis and Palestinians. Camp David started in Morocco, a secret meeting. When it starts with them, it's self-propelled. And when it starts with us, we're always in this situation of do we want it more than they do? And so I, I really, if you ask me what is my big takeaway from the last 12 years, the terrorism will only end. You know, it's interesting. I, I was in, in, uh, in Israel after 9-11. I was actually in Israel on 9-11. Um, and uh, the next morning, I got together with some of the top security people in Israel um, to just brainstorm on what, what, what happened. What do you do? And they told me something that had a big impact on me ever after. Um, they said, you know, Tom, we, our intelligence service are really good. And we can stop this one from going to the disco and this one from going to the pizza parlor, this one blowing up a bus. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it only stops when the village says no. It takes a village. And only the strongest restraints, I think, are societal, communal, and cultural. And I think one of the, that's why some of the most frightening things I saw in Iraq were when a you know, a suicide bomber blew up a funeral in a mosque during Ramadan. And I just said to myself, think how many cultural, social, religious, and communal gates that person drove through. And, um, and that's why I really think that challenging them, encouraging them, reinforcing them, amplifying them, for my money, we could not give enough money to Tunisia today. Here's a country that's passed a constitution that's one of the most progressive in the world. It's frail, it's dangerous, they're surrounded by a crumbling Libya, a crumbling Egypt. Um, we should be amplifying that, we should be doing everything we can that they want um, to reinforce that good example. Because one good example is worth a thousand theories. And, and that's really where I'd be putting my energy. And we should be a good example. Because um, we ain't the greatest advertisement for democracy lately. And I think the example we set is just as important. Thank you. So um, speaking about homegrown initiatives, uh, you mentioned Tunisia. Could you comment on what you think some of the more positive features of the Arab Spring have been and, and which in particular we should be supporting? So, I mean, the Arab Spring has been a disappointment most of all to Arabs. Um, Egypt, I picked up the paper today and one of the Egyptian billionaires who was arrested in Mubarak days for corruption is now running for parliament. Um, and uh, I think that the tragedy we're left with today, uh, as an Israeli analyst said to me, and I wrote a column about, is it looks like we only have two choices in the Arab world today. S-I-S-I -S -I and I-S-I-S. -I -S. Um, and uh, Tunisia is the only one really buck and Lebanon, my little Lebanon, you know, is bucking that trend. And um, that would be a tragedy. So my foreign policy is very simple. Where there is disorder, try to help create order. Where there's order, try to make it more decent. Where there's decent order, try to make it more consensual. And where there's consensual order, protect it like a rare flower. You mentioned the need for uh, the Arab world to take hold of this initiative on their own. It seems like Jordan has, just after this uh, recent tragedy, done just that. 
Is that the path to uh, a more stable Jordan, or is this eventually going to be their Iraq? Or are they going to get bogged down in this? And I don't mean to ask you to predict the future, yeah. but you've been in the region. Is this given the infrastructure yeah. of Jordan? I don't know how far this goes. Obviously, they're acting out of real you know, anger um, at the, at the uh, grotesque you know, death of their pilot. Um, at the end of the day, the only way ISIS is going to be removed is if um, the Sunni Arab tribes who basically let them in take them out. Um, and the only way that's going to happen is if the, those Sunni tribes uh, believe that they will have a, a secure future without the protection of ISIS. And um, I don't see that happening real soon because Iran basically is now um, heavily backing Shia militias in Iraq. And, um, you know, uh, you, you have a situation where, let me, let me try to put it to you um, from 30,000 feet, what's going on in Iraq and Syria, the way I see it. So the Middle East was a pluralistic region. Sunni, Shiites, Kurds, Druze, Jews, Christians, Turkmen, Alevis, incredibly pluralistic region, but it never had pluralism. So we have this huge pluralistic region that lacked pluralism. And therefore, its pluralistic character was always managed vertically by an iron fist from the top down. For five centuries, it was called Ottoman Turk. Then it was British and French. Then it was kings and dictators. Today, no more Ottoman Turks, no more British and French. No more king, fewer and fewer kings and dictators, and, in, and uh, especially in Iraq and Syria. So what's, what does that mean? It means there's only one way to stabilize this region: is it if it's governed horizontally by the constituent communities forging social contracts for how to live together as equal citizens. So what you're seeing is a entire giant region of the world go from vertical system of control, hopefully to horizontal. Now there's only one of three ways you can do that, stably. One is if you have a Mandela. Turns out there was only one of those, and he didn't work the Middle East. Okay? Um, one is if you have a military. Um, we hope the Egyptian army would kind of play that role. It hasn't worked out that way. And third is if you have a midwife. That was the role we aspired to play in Iraq. It turned out couldn't play very well. If you have no Mandela, no military, and no midwife, and you need to go from vertical to horizontal, you have Iraq and Syria today. And so the question is, how does this pluralistic region ever forge the social contracts to live together as equal citizens? They will only do it one way. I was in Lebanon for five years of the Civil War. It went on for almost 15 years. It was settled in Taif by a peace agreement and based on one principle, no victor, no vanquished. And that's why Lebanon continues to hold today. Tunisia is a success story because after a lot of toing and froing and killing and pressing, the secular and the Islamist communities there came to a no victor, no vanquished. How did that happen? They had civil society. They had unions, they had women's organizations, they had um, lawyers associations, and the civil society brokered that move from vertical to horizontal. Nowhere else do you have that. And and that's why the, this region, I, I really fear for its future. Because I'm just making this up, but 60 years ago, Asian dictators basically came to their people and said, my people, here's the deal. We're going to take away your freedom. But we're going to give you the best infrastructure and education money can buy. And in 60 years, you'll build a middle class big enough to take your freedom back in places like Korea and Taiwan, whatnot. In the Arab world, what happened is Arab leaders came to their people 60 years ago and said, my people, we're going to take away your freedom, and we're going to give you the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, it was the worst trade in history. And so now you're seeing the product of 60 years of predatory government, maleducation. And I now realize in retrospect that the Arab Human Development Report, which came out in 2002 by the UNDP, written by Arabs, was the last cry. It was a cry in 2002. What did it conclude? We have a deficit of freedom, a deficit of women's empowerment, and a deficit of knowledge. And unless we turn you know, away onto a new track and overcome those deficits, we're in real trouble. 
And unfortunately, that report was deep sixed in part because 9-11, then we needed these governments to fight terrorism. And, and now you have a, a real human development crisis there. And there is no easy answer. You know, I can ruin any dinner party. And, um, I, um, <laughs> and I don't want to ruin yours, so maybe we should take one last question uh, if you want and um, end, on a, end on a high note. You're out? You're all out? Well, well you know, um, then, then I'll, 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 I'll end it um, this way, which is I, I first want to thank you guys. You were fantastic. Absolutely. Um, you, uh, you did your colleagues in school proud. Um, and I would just say this, you know, what I fall back on um, in these kind of moments where I really don't know what to do anymore. I do fall back on one thing, as there's one thing I still think we can all control, and that's this country. And making this country um, uh, a true example of what we do have, a pluralistic society with pluralism. Because I think um, in this age, where all across the world we're gonna see the end of top-down hierarchical control. I like to say the ROI on pluralism, the return on investment on pluralism, I think is gonna explode in the era we're going into. And Lord knows we are still a work in progress. One need only see the news from Ferguson to know that. But we have, we have twice now elected a black man whose middle name is Hussein, whose grandfather was a Muslim, who defeated a woman to run against a Mormon, okay? <laughs> so um, who the heck does that, all right? <laughs> and um, we need to... We need to not pat ourselves on the back for that. We need to appreciate what a special thing we have here is. And lately, we've been kicking this country around like it's a football. It's not a football. It's a Fabergé egg. And we better not drop it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.